Welcome to Curator with a Camera. Today we're in the North East and we're going to talk about the North Eastern Railway baggage car of 1904. When Newcastle got trams in about 1901, the receipts for the railway dropped something like 57%. And the manager of the North Eastern was a fellow called George Gibb. He was a bit of a futurist, really. He was a very, very competent manager. And he said, well, what are we going to do about this? Well, fortunately, locally, there was Charles Mertz. And Mertz is known as the father of the national grid. And Mertz persuaded Gibb to electrify his railway. And that's what they did. The line was electrified with 600 volts DC. Third rail electrification has got a, a rail to one side, and that's where the power is picked up from. So there's no overhead wire, it's picked up from the third rail. This was a train that accelerated quickly, could fill with passengers quickly, you could drive it from one end with one driver. You didn't need any of those train movements that were common in the steam era. And that meant that the trams could be seen off. People get completely used to the idea of trains being very frequent and not smoky and dirty as they were in steam days. And actually, it leads to the growth of the suburbs. You know, if you've got some money, you might think, well, I'll go and live by the seaside. Well, you could with this, because you'd get there quickly. And in fact, very quickly, the North Eastern had express services out to the coast electric express services. And the cars look like this, except this one's a baggage car. What they found when they were running the trains, because of course the trains run out to Whitley Bay in places, that they used to take boxes of fish and things back for the market. And they found that people complained of the smell of fish on the trains. So the baggage cars were pressed into service for that particular use. So this is the North Eastern Railway baggage car of 1904. It's the sole survivor of that first wave of mainline electrification in the UK. And really, we're very lucky to have it because not only did these vehicles, a lot of them disappear in a fire that the uh, North Eastern had, um, but also this one only survived because it was used as a de-icer. And here at the Stevenson Railway Museum, they look after it for us and in fact, they helped restore it. So let's have a look at the outside of the um, Northeastern baggage car. The livery is that fantastic Northeastern Railway, bright red and cream livery, kind of welcome to the future sort of livery. And the windows, big windows, except the driver's side window is a porthole. And the porthole window is because when they first came out, these vehicles, they had these big glass windows and the drivers were worried about stone throwing. This is 1904. They were worried about that kind of vandalism then. And they get given a porthole window. Now, a porthole is the same as on a ship in that the stresses on the window uh, are shared equally all the way around the circle. There's no, there's no point whereby you get extra stress as you would have if it was square or rectangular. So effectively, a porthole window is a form of, of, of safety window before you have safety glass. And then when you come round, uh, you see that very typical of this period, matchboard uh, exterior, very, very nicely detailed lettering. Of course, it's restored, but it's, it's restored exactly as it would have been. And then you get down the side, the axle boxes, of course, proudly say Northeastern Railway. And then here's the shoe beam. This is the way you pick up your electricity. Of course, this vehicle can't pick up electricity anymore. It doesn't have any motors, but it was used as a um, de-icer. And the de-icer thing is this thing here. And right at the bottom of it, I know you can see that, you've got those blades. And the blades are there to, to basically scrape the ice off before you get to the shoe. And that's the shoe there, that's a sprung shoe, which would pick up the power from 600 volts DC and put it into the motors. Um, and the, the guy could then notch it up uh, and put a bit of power on 
and get the train moving quickly. And if he's taking fish from the uh, caught in the ports of, of Tyneside into Newcastle Market, speed would be of the essence. The thing about the North Eastern Railway is they were very, very forward facing. In terms of third rail uh, as a means of, of powering a train, of course, the North East uh, and um, around Liverpool, they were ahead of London in using this system. The, the third rail system that you're so used to south of the River Thames, actually, it follows on from what happened in Merseyside and Tyneside. And really, the baggage car, that's what it's telling you. We are a company that's facing the future and we know what we think that future is. Now we've looked at the outside of the baggage car and now it's time to go inside and see what remains of that revolutionary vehicle from 1904. Well, here we are inside the baggage car and Surprise, surprise, it's still being used for baggage. And it's got that uh, interior. They've um, made the woodwork look even more like woodwork by using the scrumbling uh, of um, a varnish, which was common in that day. It's got reinforcing because you're moving parcels and goods, heavy items that needed to be moved uh, by the railway would come in here almost anything you could name because in those days you could take a parcel to a station and they'd have to offer a rate uh, for it be to be transported that included it taken into Newcastle and then transferred in Newcastle onto an express for London or Edinburgh or across to Carlisle or wherever you wanted that parcel to go and you can see that here we've got these uh, luggage here uh, which has been put in here just for show really but it reveals itself when you look at the top of it there's a scattered old label there that basically says delivered luggage one shilling and one penny paid and the one above it's got a, a, a luggage label from br eastern region period because luggage in advance carried on into the 1980s and this is from somewhere to Sunderland. So that would be stuck on something that was being delivered. And it's got a um, clear story, a clerestory roof with some extra ventilators here, which you can turn to get some air into the system a bit better. And the ventilators up here will work so you can get more air in. And um, aside from that, there's one other survivor from that period. We've got a rattan covered seat, very much like um, you might have on a tram, it'll fold forwards and it'll fold backwards, so you get, go in the right direction of travel. And then, unlike the Metro today uh, in Newcastle, you can't see ahead. On the current Metro trains, you can sit near the driver and see ahead. But um, in those days, no, the driver's door is firmly closed to us at this point. Above it, there's a tool cupboard, and the tool cupboard, well, let's just have a look, see whether there's anything interesting in it, you never know. Um, All there is is a notice saying penalty for neglect, two pounds. Well, tools you might carry with you on an electric railway. There's probably some spanners and things like that. But um, electric railways often also had a thing called the paddle. And they called it the paddle because it looks like a paddle. And it was for pushing things off the third rail, which shouldn't be there. Which, of course, the third rail would occasionally catch out wild animals and uh, you needed to push them off the third rail. But if we go through to the driver's cab, we can have a look at what remains of the driver's cab and look at that porthole window. OK, so here we are in the motorman's uh, space, the driver, as it were. He was called a motorman. And um, there's very little left because, of course, it was all stripped out when it became a de-icer. The, the, there's a break here. Um, an ordinary brake to, to parking brake basically and you've got windows with typical for um, uh, steam era windows they've got a leather strap which is designed so that you can set it and it drops like that I mean not unusual and 
The railways used to complain that these leather straps were kept being stolen for people to sharpen their um, cutthroat razors on. Um, I mean, they were very common in steam days to have these in, in carriages. And again, it's another wooden interior, beautifully done interior. It's got a door that allows you to connect through to um, the next carriage. And then up here, you can get into the, to change the, um, the head codes and change the bulbs for the head codes. What's left of where the equipment was, well, it's like archaeology. All you've got here is some holes in the floor and a mass of cables just there. And then here, there's a circle that's the hint of where your, your brake dial would go. And as a driver, you'd be stood in this space here. He's actually, of course, controlling all the motors down the train. So if this was a passenger train, all the motors of the full length of the train are controlled from one position. And that comes uh, from an inventor in America called Frank Sprague. And, and Sprague's work makes him really the, the father of the electric railway because it means that it doesn't matter how many carriages you have on, there's one driver and he's controlling all the motors down the train. And that control system comes across from America and the Northeastern being very interested in, in the future. They, of course, adopt this system for the electrification of the Northeastern. And just in case you want the portal window open, well, it will open. Um, I guess, it, it, you know, if you if you wanted some extra air, you could do that. Yeah, I don't think it'd be particularly often they would do that. But you also got a notch. You could you could strap step it back if you needed to uh, get a bit more air in the cab. But that's basically the driver's cab. Uh, not a lot to see because the equipment was stripped out. But just imagine there's one person stood here and he's looking ahead. And unlike that steam engine out there, he can see straight down at the track approaching him. Um, and this eventually got people worried that people would be mesmerised by the sleepers coming towards them. Uh, and that's why uh, early diesels often had a bonnet in front of them to make people look into the middle distance rather than uh, down below. But of course, in coupling terms, in terms of running the train, uh, being able to see the buffers is really helpful because you can couple up to a train very easily because you can see down there the, the coupling and the buffers. It's, it's altogether a, a safe way of working a train. If you worked on the Northeastern Railway, around about 1900, you were on a steam railway that was moving a lot of coal around. And then along comes this electric railway on Tyneside, and it was like looking at a revolution. So we're stood inside a vehicle that marks that, that revolution, that big step away from the steam age. It took a long time to embed itself within the UK, but the Northeast is one of the places it started, just as the Northeast is really the birthplace of the railways full stop. If you've enjoyed this episode of Curator with the Camera, please leave a like or subscribe. Thank you.